If you would, please turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 21, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 21, verses 11 and 12, and that will serve as our text this morning. The great prophet, Messianic prophet, living over 700 years before Jesus Christ walked this earth, wrote so much in this book about Christ in a prophetic way. But he also wrote concerning the situation of the times. And he says in verse 11, The burden of Duma, he called, calleth to me out of Seir. And then the phrase that we want to really look at, or the question, Watchman, what of the night? And he repeats it, watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning comes and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. I think we all want to discharge our obligations to God if we have the right attitude toward Him and toward those obligations that He puts upon us in His good Word. And in effect, this is what Isaiah is doing at this time. Notice that the prophet speaks concerning what he calls the burden of Duma. Well, we normally would think of Duma as being a kind of place, but, but not here. Kyle and Delich in their good commentary had this to say concerning Duma. The name as it stands here is symbolical and without any demonstrable topographical application. Duma is deep, utter silence and therefore the land of the dead. So we have then the burden of the land of the dead. Now what is that burden? As I said earlier, he dealt with matters pertaining to that day as well as matters pertaining to Christ. And in answer to the question, what is that burden? It is that of one who is calling out of the nearby mountain range, which was in the land of Seir. Seir is in Idumea. Seir is populated by the descendants of Esau. And they cry out to the watchman. And remember what a watchman does, especially in a city and upon the city walls, why the city had walls in the first place. What of the night? Maybe how long the night and so on. But what of the night? Well, let's keep in the context, the environment in which this whole thing is set and the prophet doing his work is to things of that day and time. Well, the Edomites were looking for deliverance from what was a threat all throughout that part of the Middle East for a long time, and that was the invaders from Babylon. They would eventually, of course, destroy Judah and Jerusalem. There would be the 70 years of captivity due to the sins of Judah. The duplication of the expression, and I don't know all the reasons that he duplicates it, but it may represent the intensity at which they felt the pressing of the night. Now let me pause here and say, anything coming out of the Middle East press upon us today? I'm not saying that's what he's talking about at all. I'm just saying we undergo the same pressing. Different reasons. Some of the reasons are much like the reasons they had then. But things get on our minds. Problems are there. And if you went back to December 8, 1941, there'd be something pressing out of the Far East on the United States. And on the minds of everybody. Would press greatly on it for the next few years. And so these of Edom 
Ask what? <coughs> what of the night? What's going on tonight? How long the night? The reply is the morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return. Come. So what he answers is, well, there's both morning and night. They're both coming. But you have to ask the question, and the prophet recognizes this, well, for whom is the morning coming? And for whom is the night coming? Well, remember, Israel was punished by God, but from Israel, and specifically Judah, from the house of David, there would come a Messiah. So Israel had to remain on this earth till according to the flesh, the Messiah come from the house of David. So while God dealt with the sins of His people, and the ten northern tribes making up the kingdom of Israel had already gone into Syrian captivity. And then eventually Babylon would take sinful Judah into captivity. But they didn't end there. That is Judah. The morning would come. Their time, if you please, in prison, Babylonian captivity would come to an end. But not so of Edom. You want to call them their cousins. You might remember this, that Herod was of Edomia. And we usually call them in modern times at least Edomian Arabs. To distinguish between those descendants of Esau and the Arabs who came from Hagar. The night was coming for Edom. But not for Israel. Israel would learn. A lot of sins she would get into after she came back. The remnant came back to Jerusalem. She never would be troubled with idolatry any longer. It burned idolatry out of their system. That is the Babylonian captivity. But Edom, you know of any Edomites? <laughs> you know of the nation of Edom? They're not here. They're gone. Long gone. With the Philistines and the Ammonites and most others that were nations of that part of the world. Is there anything we learn from this? You know, this was written for my learning to be a better Christian today, to appreciate Christ and His authority in the New Testament. So it wasn't just written for then. Well, spiritually, the morning came for all those who inquired of God, learned their obligations to God from His Word, humbly repented of their sins, and served Him. But the night comes to all those who refuse Him, who continue in their own ways, in their own will, and will not repent. Now how is this a text for us, and what can we get out of it? Well, first of all, I want to look at the watchman. Inspiration had Isaiah use the watchman, and they all knew what that was. We don't know much about that nowadays. In those days, they lived in the cities. The cities were surrounded by walls. Most of them were farmers if they were not traders in some sort of shops in the towns. But those, li those who lived in the town who were farmers went outside the city walls and worked their land, but they came back in for protection. That may tell you how the world was at that time as far as it being safe. And there were watchmen who went about throughout the night. Maybe at 1 o'clock in the morning they would cry out literally and actually, 1 o'clock and all is well. There's much said about this in the scriptures. So the watchman here is God's messenger. He's the one who sounds out God's will for mankind. Watchman, what other night? This is a common occurrence as far as the use of watchman for God's messenger. Go with me over to Ezekiel in the third chapter, beginning in verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, that's Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, 
and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require it, thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And it goes on to develop this. My emphasis here is why inspiration had Isaiah refer to the watchman in his work, and then have Ezekiel call himself a watchman in his prophetic work of that time to those people. So I learned that one who's a watchman cannot say, well, I'll wake everybody up if I cry too loud. And yet there's an army besieging the walls going to destroy everybody. But you would want that man as a watchman. And you see then that he must give the message. The message that is true, no matter whether it's good in the sense of what it portends for the people who need to hear it. Or whether it's bad because their lives are not what they ought to be before God. Now this brings me down to the importance of the watchman of the night not being a respecter of persons. Most of us who are familiar with the teaching of the Bible and we study God is no respecter of persons. Think of Peter at the house of Cornelius, the first uncircumcised Gentile convert. And Peter is learning that the gospel is not just for the Jew, but the gospel is for all, as we sing in the old song sometimes. That the conditions of salvation are not one thing for the Jew and something completely different for the Gentile. The idea of respect of persons actually comes from a Greek word, rather long word, and it means the face pleaser. You adjust your message according to how much you favor the person you're speaking to. So if you really like this fellow, for whatever reason you like him, and you know he's real good friends with you, then you don't say much about sins in his life, if anything at all. On the other hand, the fellow you don't like anyway, not friends with you, you tear him up. Of course, that never happens today, does it? <laughs> it is a great dangerous thing. God is not that way. We do not think, we must not think of God as capricious man. We must recognize that we who are members of His Son's church, the family of God, brothers and sisters of Christ, must display out of the heart the same disposition. Frankly, we like to play favorites. And that's a sad situation. You know, if you look in Jacob's life, he was partly the cause that Joseph was treated the way Joseph was treated. He favored that boy more than he did the other boys. They were jealous of him. His daddy was blind to what he was doing. He made him a coat of many colors, which may not sound much to us today, but at that time... It was a great thing. Who did he give it to? The baby boy at that time. He favored him. Now they were wrong in what they did, of course, but nevertheless, Jacob didn't help matters there. But Jacob had had a problem all through the years with a little bit along that line. You know, Jacob, Hebrew, Yaakov, means he'll catch her. He's a very subtle person. He did a lot of things that suited Jacob. And he might not treat you the same way according to how he viewed you. He did a lot of changing in his life. So much so that God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Anytime you see a Hebrew word with E-L on it, it pertains to God. He was Prince of God. That says a lot about Character changing and the fact that men can change if they really want to. It destroys the idea that I'm born one way in this world and can't do a thing in the world about it. I can change. I can change for bad. I can change for good. And you know, a lot of it is going to be helped along 
by those who will not show respect to persons with me. When parents are rearing their children, they dare not show respect to persons. And yet it happens all the time. In Romans 2, in verse 11, Paul says to the Romans, there's no respect to persons with God. And then if you go over to chapter 3 and verse 22, speaking of the fact that all men must hear, believe, and obey the same gospel, and the conditions are all the same for everybody in order to be saved from their sins. He speaks of God putting no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. No difference. He doesn't make a difference. A person who shows respect to persons makes a difference in this person, that person. Do you know this is one of the great temptations for those who are close friends with one another? You don't want to upset them. You, you, you don't want to do that. Now, if you don't know them very well, it's a lot easier to let them have it. But when you get close with people, that's one of the things the devil is going to do to tempt you and your obligations to God and the salvation of souls. You just don't mention certain things. Now let me let you in on a little secret, if it is a secret to you. The longer a preacher stays with the congregation, the more apt he is not to deliver the truth they need. Can you guess why? You build relationships. And there's the emotional relationship there. Now here's what's sad about things is that so many members, the closer they get to the preacher, expect him not to nail their hide to the wall if something is necessary. Granted, the truth of God comforts those who are faithful and diligent in the cause of Christ. But it was never meant to comfort those who are mediocre who are one talent and won't use it, who are inactive, who are murmurers and complainers. So when somebody asks, Watchman, what of the night? Well, what night are we talking about? What of the day? Well, what day are we talking about? Is it the day you're in and the way you're living? Maybe different from one from the other according to their own attitude toward God's Word. The song we sang a moment ago, Give Me the Bible. There are a whole host of people that don't even, even in the church, don't really, who don't really think about what they're saying. Give me God's word, which word tells me my responsibility to God because I want to obey Him. Just give it to me just like it is. Well, people say that sometimes. But when it comes right down to receiving with meekness the engrafted word, they don't receive it with meekness or any other way except to be offended. So there's several places in the Bible that if a person will be a watchman, and aren't we all as faithful members of the church watchmen for ourselves and for one another? Indeed we are. We are our brother's keeper. We are not to seek to please men. We are to seek to save them. Galatians 1.10, Paul had to remind those Galatians of this very point. He said, for I am now... Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? You know, sometimes you can have it both ways. If you've got people who love the Lord and keep His commandments, and you seek God's favor and their favor, then that's all well and good. But all too often, to be the watchman of the night that is faithful to His work, in order to be faithful to God, you may really have to upset some men. Not always. But all too often it's the case. And Paul had to ask Galatians because of the errors they had gotten themselves into. If I were still pleasing men, he said, I, I should not be a servant of Christ. Even when you're doing things that please people because both of you want to please God, then you still must realize, first of all, you seek to please God. Now this is not just the preacher per se. It's true of the elders and the deacons and every member of the Lord's church. Their first desire is to please God and let the chips fall where they may. But reality says something else. James said to members of the church in James chapter 4 and verse 4, and this is pretty potent, Ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity or hate with God? 
Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world maketh himself an enemy of God. Now why do you write that to the church if he's talking about being a friend of the world? Because members of the church all too often have these alliances and associations with those who are not Christians and they don't want to say what ought to be said or do what ought to be done to please God because it's going to upset who they work for, the government they're under, family members, school students that are your friends. But you have to finally come to grips if you're going to be faithful all the days of your life and go to heaven that you have to please God whether pleasing anybody else or not. And do not confuse just having it your own way according to your own will and then say, well, that's pleasing God, so if I get my will done, then that suits things well. Don't confuse your likes, your dislikes, your opinions, your will with the will of God as set out in the Word of God. When I think of Ananias and Sapphira, there's the first sin that we know of in the church. How could a husband and wife collaborate together to lie and then say this makes us great fine Christians? But they did. And so we can do the same thing in deceiving ourselves. And they did it with right to the Apostle Peter. And Peter had to say, you didn't lie to men, you lied to God. Now is my life a lie to God? Are there aspects of my life that are a lie to God? Well, if your life in any way is contrary to what the Bible says a Christian ought to be doing, you're lying to yourself that you're still all right. Now, what's the watchman of the night to cry out for? What is he to say? What is he to do if he makes full proof of his ministry, which Paul, by inspiration, said the preacher ought to do as he wrote to Timothy? We dare not compromise his message. We dare not let friendship and associations and even family members certainly stop us from saying what ought to be said to everybody. And if anybody ever wants to be a preacher like you read of in your New Testament that is well pleasing to God, you cannot let people determine what you're going to say. You can't do it. Now if you notice in 1 Kings 22, verse 14. See the prophet Micaiah. And here's what he says. As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. That's a marvelous statement. But I'm afraid there are a lot of preachers that don't even believe that. In Galatians 1, 8 through 9, Paul said, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be anathema. There, the King James says accursed. And it means cut off from God. You teach false doctrine, you ought to be cut off from God. That's how God looks at it. And if I am a preacher of doctrine contrary to the truth, or I withhold doctrine that ought to be said to you, then God is saying to me, I need to be cut off from him as long as I hold that view and conduct myself accordingly. And he says, as we've said before, so say I now again. If any man preacheth unto you any gospel other than that which you receive, let him be accursed or anathema. Now, inspiration doesn't have to repeat itself to convey the message God wants. But I tell you, that makes me sit up and take notice when it does. If that doesn't show emphasis and importance, I don't know what would. In Acts 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul stood there, if you please, and he said, Wherefore I testify unto you this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I shrink not from declaring unto you the whole counsel of God. American Standard Version. God expects a watchman to not show respect to persons. I know for a fact that that happens when it comes to preachers, when it has to do with preaching things that the elders need to hear, or that their own family needs to hear, or their best friends. But especially those who write the paycheck. Now listen, if you want to get somebody compromised, you just keep in mind, if I say this right here, I, I don't get paid or I get put on the road. 
Well, that won't work. Elders, if they're what God says elders ought to be, and if they want to go to heaven as elders, they want somebody that's a preacher that will preach what they need to hear, whether it upsets them or not. It just must be that way. There's just no other way. If heaven's going to be your home, now if heaven, you don't care much about it, then you do whatever you want to do. That's very simple. We're not of the night, Paul said. We don't go around cloaked and hiding like a thief in the night. But we're of the day. We're in the light of truth. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Well, darkness in the sense of light of truth. They had to hear everything they needed to hear and learn from it. So they would see life as it really is and their duties to God. For ye are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. And that's keeping with the same idea I mentioned a while ago in Isaiah. What of the night? Well, there's a day and a night coming. Who's the day for? Who's the night for? The day is for the person enlightened by the truth of the gospel and lives by it daily, preaches and contends for it. The night belongs to those who reject the truth, deceive themselves, and will not preach the whole counsel of God. One of the things that bothers me, and it's always a temptation to preachers, but it's so true now in the church. Somebody goes and they attend a church somewhere and they say, well, I didn't hear anything wrong. That's good. But was everything addressed that ought to have been addressed? Were problems in the church dealt with? Well, you can preach everything right and die and go to hell. There's going to be a lot of people do that. Now you can attend every service of the church and read your Bible daily, pray as you ought to, and die and lose your soul. Because you don't deal with every aspect of your life bringing it into subjection to Jesus Christ. You ignore those things. I said in the beginning, you just ignore those things. You just don't look at them. It's not what so much is said that's right. It's what is left unsaid that ought to be said, that needs to be said. And people can't be what they ought to Unless they hear it. In Acts 26 and verse 18. It says of the gospel. That it's to open their eyes. That they may turn from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive remission of sins. And an inheritance among them. That are sanctified by faith. In Christ. You got to preach the whole counsel of God. You never go wrong doing that. Now, there's another thing concerning elders. Elders ought to demand that it be preached. They ought to watch what a preacher's preaching over, let's say, a year's time. And say, we haven't heard anything on this subject. The preacher may not realize he's overlooked it. But if elders are listening, they ought to be listening to see, first of all, is he preaching the truth and is he living according to it himself? Next of all, they ought to say, we don't need to have this neglected. And then say, how about preach on this? How about preach on that? Now, Brother Buddy some time ago says, let's have some sermons or some lessons, or a lesson, whichever way it works. And I mention it off and on because that's the way we're getting the lesson done. Part of it, anyway. About uh, Satan's devices. Uh, I'm talking about one of them right now. Satan's devices. One of those devices is to preach the truth all day long. Just don't tell people what they need to hear that are in the congregation listening to you. And they may need to hear quick complaining and griping about the elders when you don't do anything, much anything, but complain and gripe the elders. <laughs> and the elders may need to hear if you're going to be elders, you have to know the church. You have to know the people you're overseeing. You have to know their growth and development or the lack of it. You have to know where they are. I have a long time feared greatly that elders have missed the teaching of the Bible on being shepherds of the flock. I don't know how they can miss it in view of what the Bible says about shepherds and flocks and describing literal shepherds of sheep in the flocks. I know this much. Uh, if you had a hundred head of cows, you wouldn't go check on them once a year. Especially they cost a couple of thousand dollars a head. Do you understand money? <laughs> we understand that. Then the other thing is, is our own brethren, our contribution. I read a thing the other day from supposedly a member of the church talking about how preachers just speak, 
preach on money simply to give the people a guilt trip. Well, you know, preaching on money and contribution doesn't give me a guilt trip when I'm doing what I know the Bible says I ought to do. So maybe if they've got a guilt trip, they know they're sending and going to hell because of it. Do you believe that lack of contribution of your money to the church can send you to torment? If you don't believe it, you need to hear it a lot quicker than a lot of other folks because it sure will. These are things that must be said. But here's another thing. What about the elders going to every member of the church and saying, we need you to consider your contribution? Oh, so-and-so's not giving like he ought to. Have you gone and told him? You're a shepherd, aren't you? Do you have that authority? You sure do. More than anybody else in this church. Or any other thing about their life that has to do with whether they're going to heaven or hell. They have every right to come and talk to you about that. If they don't, just remove shepherd out of the idea of elders. Just remove it. Don't have to be any business there. Watchman! What of the night? Respect the persons. The night is dark and uncertain. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. John 12 and verse 35, and he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because the light is not in him. John eleven ten. Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And we did sing a while ago, and did we really mean it? Give me the Bible. Star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer alone in tempest tossed. We did mean that, didn't we? John 8, 12, Again, therefore Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Night is dangerous. I remember one time we used to play out at home at night, and I don't, I'm sure glad there wasn't computers in those days. Missed a whole lot. But we'd play and run all over the country, never gave thought to anything, and I hurt my poor old shin. I still remember it right now. We were all playing tag or something, and I was running down a cow trail. Anybody know what a cow trail is? <laughs> I was running down a cow trail, stumped my toe, and when I fell, I crammed my shin right into a rock, and I hobbled around all over the place. And you just can't see in the night running down a cow trail like you can in the day. You can at least see in a cow trail what to not step in. In Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ours is the greatest battle as the Lord's army, the church, ever was. We battle against that which rules the whole world and keeps it in darkness. And if the church of Christ does not do it, nobody else is going to do it. For God put you here as the army of the Lord and each individual member as a soldier to do his bidding. The blindness of the night then brings hazards. And the preaching of the truth without respect of person is the only thing that's going to change it. People get themselves into marriages. They get themselves into all kinds of immorality. They don't want to hear it. But when you stand before your God in judgment, the judgment bar of Christ, you will give an account of thoughts, words, and actions of your whole life in the light of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And does it say anything about marriage, divorce, or remarriage? Does it say anything about the importance of truth? And does it talk about lies and deceitfulness and how we should avoid it? Does it say anything about how to become a Christian? Does it say anything about the church, its work, its organization, its worship? Does it tell you about how to be a saint and what it means to be a saint, to be holy, to be faithful to the Lord? You see, even in preaching this lesson this morning, watchman, what of the night? God is no respecter of persons. The watchman of God cannot be a respecter of persons. I've had to still speak many times in generalities because you just can't say everything in the time you have allotted over even a whole year. All the details that only God and you know in your own mind about what you're doing and not doing.
about your motives. As John talked Wednesday night about the disposition of heart and your attitude. So I hope we realize what's involved in the watchman of the night. That he is no respecter of persons. That God is no respecter of persons. That no faithful Christian can be a respecter of persons. That we cannot practice favoritism. And may I say that if you're going to accuse somebody of favoritism, that means as a Christian you have the evidence that he is or you would make that accusation. And if you can't prove it, you're going to have to give an account of that unless you repent of it. So never make that accusation unless you know to begin with it's true. There's no prosecuting attorney under the, uh, attorney under the sun who would bring charges enough to go to court if he didn't think he had the evidence to prove his case. And if that's the case in a world run by worldly people, what about the saints of light and our dealing one with another? We're going to charge somebody with something. Let us already know how to prove that our charge is true and that we're doing it according to the instruction of God and acting accordingly. If not, we're going to lose our own soul on the day of judgment. You charge somebody with something, you can't prove it. Do you think God's going to let you buy with that on the day of judgment? Of course not. Not me nor anybody else. And then let us be prepared if we are a Peter and a Paul withstands us to the face to know that a Paul does it out of love, 1 Corinthians 13, because he doesn't want a person to practice error and think he can go to heaven because he won't. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we always close our messages by giving people opportunity to become Christians, urging to if they're not. Or as a child of God, if they sin, to repent of sins and confess them and pray for forgiveness. To become a Christian, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. To repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to be restored, honestly, as you look within your heart the light of truth and God looks with you, then think of this invitation to be what you ought to be before God, who is no respecter of persons and respond accordingly while we stand and sing.